Warning, this podcast contains the kind of language that makes old Mormon ladies faint. This week's episode of The Skating Atheist is brought to you by the new legal compliance service for bigoted Christian bakeries in Oregon that just lost a lawsuit for $135,000. Coxers for Doxers. Our team of certified, genuine, non-bigoted humanists will draw gay dicks on your pastries for the low, low price of $134,000, well below the market price of refusing service to same-sex couples and posting their personal information online. Coxers for Doxers. Outsource a gland, save a grand. And now, the scathing atheist. This is Michael from the LC Valley's Atheist Alliance on Facebook, and I just want to assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's Thursday. It's July 23rd. And if you play Audacity with Dark Side of the Moon as the soundtrack... Ray Comfort hates gay people in perfect rhythm. Occasionally in a 7-4. It's so weird. Never seen that before. I'm No Illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from In Bread, White, and Blue, Valdosta, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll read basically the same letter from Paul for the sixth and seventh time. Josh Forestine delivers a meaningless rant with Carrie Fisher on a chain just off screen. And Bryce Blankenegel will be back to conclude the story of Joseph Smith in more ways than one. But first... The diatribe. You know, I've given a couple of high minded answers in interviews before. But when it comes down to it, the reason that we started this show in the first place was for times just like this. When I first came to Heath and I said, hey, dude, we should start an atheist podcast. He basically just said, yeah, good call. But if he had asked me why, my answer would have been because once in a while I see shit online that pisses me off so much that I have to find somebody else to vent to or my wife is going to divorce me. And here I am in precisely one of those situations. I log on to Facebook the other day. I see that scores of our listeners have shared the same video. So even before I checked out what it was or anything. I had a feeling I might have just found the subject for this week's diatribe. There's a good chance you've already seen the clip I'm bitching about. Uh, It's started making the rounds the day after we dropped last week's show. So it's had plenty of time to percolate through the atheist community and a number of prominent bloggers and podcasters have sounded off on it. But in case you haven't heard about it or in case you're listening in archives, let me lay out what's got my nuts in a bunch here. So apparently there's a show on ABC called What Would You Do? The premise is that they hide a camera and they get a bunch of actors to play out some everyday situation and they test to see what random strangers around them will do, right? So it's like a like a Psych 101 version of Candid Camera. So I guess on last Friday's show, they decided to act out the following everyday scenario. You have a clean-cut family with 2.3 kids and a mortgage and shit, and they're at a diner, and they all join hands to pray before they eat. And then an angry atheist gets up, crosses the fucking restaurant, and tells him to stop praying because she's an atheist. You know, like we do. Just your everyday run-of-the-mill, how dare you pray near me, now stop it before I shit on your brioche-type moments that we atheists are want to instigate. You know, the kind of thing that happens when you don't pay actors to act this shit out. Look, I'm not trying to brag here, but I have never met an atheist that is a bigger asshole than me. I'm vitriolic, I'm vulgar, callous, disrespectful, but blasphemous, contemptuous, and crass for a fucking living. And the most you would ever see me do if I saw a family praying next to me at dinner is roll my eyes. You catch me on a particularly bad day and I might loudly thank the naked masturbating ghost of George Carlin for my food when it comes out, but the nonsensical scenario that they've created is the kind of thing that only happens in Kirk Cameron movies and Pat Robertson's cough syrup nightmares. But despite that fact, the producers over at What Would You Do consider this the kind of everyday situation that they could just recreate. Now, keep in mind, everyday situation, that is their term. That's how they describe their show on their fucking website, putting people in everyday situations to find out what they would do. And in this instance, they were completely unable to separate everyday occurrence from asinine stereotype created by oppressive zealots trying to undermine legitimate efforts at social reform by conflating them with completely unreasonable caricatures. You know, imagine a guy walks into the pitch meeting, he says, okay, so we're going to have an actress, she's going to play a feminist, she walks in and demands to use whichever fucking bathroom she wants. Or, or you know, like, two lesbians walk into a Christian bookstore, they start handing out buy two, get one free abortion coupons. Do you think that those would pass for the everyday situations they're looking for? 
I mean, even if every single person involved in the decision chain is a Christian that hates atheists, it's still their job not to offend large swaths of people by accident, isn't it? So how is it that nobody realized that they were reinforcing a defamatory stereotype? Now, some of it clearly comes from a concerted effort from the religious right to promote and reinforce said stereotype, right? You, you got Fox News out there willing to put their full and unabiding trust in any sixth grader who insists he was suspended from school for reading his Bible and definitely not jerking off in a library. Meanwhile, you got these pastors telling their flocks that atheists are trying to pass laws that will allow us to feed them to lions if they say bless you when we sneeze. You got religious teachers telling their students at religious schools and public schools that we just made the whole evolution thing up and backed it up with a worldwide conspiracy of journals, symposiums, and conferences and Nobel Prizes just to fuck them out of their Jesus juice. So sure, the pump is primed to believe that this is the kind of shit atheists do all the time, but there's also something else at work here, because many of these fuckers, including all the ones that work at ABC apparently, honestly don't see the difference between trying to remove prayer from a public meeting and screaming at a random family while they're trying to say grace. They see stories about atheist groups trying to get high school football coaches to stop leading their teams in prayer, and they figure this is, you know, this is the same situation only in a diner. You know, I guess they've just been adrift so long in their vast ocean of privilege that they've forgotten that there's a shoreline out there. It's like telling the judge that the puppy rape was unavoidable because there's just no other way to get your dick into it. And here's the most fucked up thing about it. Okay, so if you wanted to tweak that little segment on what would you do to make it believable, all you have to do is swap out the Christian family for a Muslim one and the atheist for a Christian. Now, all of a sudden, you've got something that really happens. And you have a truly interesting question about whether any of the Texan diners would stand up for a Muslim family. I mean, honestly, how many atheists have you seen on the news lined up outside a mosque to torment Muslims over their private worship? Any? Zero? Perhaps? How many atheists have you seen bully their way to a podium to rip the microphone out of a Muslim's hands while they're in the middle of a public prayer? I can show you a Christian doing that. How many atheists have you seen blocking the construction of a mosque or a Muslim cemetery or a Muslim rec center? It, it would take you two seconds to find a news story about Christians doing any one of those things. But if you want to find an atheist doing something like that, apparently you have to hire a bunch of actors and a bigoted TV producer. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is my partner in crime, Heath Enright. Heath, are you ready to aid in a bet? Ah, uh, I think you used that one before. Yes, I did, but that Cycle. was like it was like more than a hundred episodes ago, so it's, it's less of a repeat and more of a best of. Whatever you got to tell yourself, that's what I got to tell. You're myself. a tracer. In our lead story tonight. Despite what some extremely reliable Facebook posts may have told you, Seattle Mayor Ed Murray is not planning to implement Sharia law in the city, nor will he be forcing any businesses to comply with Islamic teachings. He is, however, spending his time working on financing options that would allow Muslims to obtain home mortgages without paying interest on the loan, uh -huh. because they have a strongly held belief that it works out better for them as borrowers without the interest which would seem like a blatant effort to game the system if they weren't also prohibited from charging interest <laughs> right. so, no yeah both sides it's right. not insidious so much as just garden variety <laughs> yeah. stupid just stupid so apparently Allah missed class on the day they taught all the gods about how present value of money and future value of money are both real things and uh different amounts i, I swear every subject muhammad didn't address is a blessing if you're a fucking Muslim. You must just wake up every day thinking, whoo, I'm so glad he didn't spend more time on dick washing procedures. I'd still be snaking out my urethra with a cactus needle or something. Man, I'm glad those <laughs> chapters got lost. Well, as it turns out, this whole issue is meaningless. You don't because say. Because Muslims can borrow or lend with interest as long as they give the interest a clever new name. Like, for example... Regular payments over the course of a loan that compensate the lender for their share of the profits from an asset worth exactly the amount of the loan by coincidence. And by <laughs> asset, they mean piece of paper with the loan amount written on it. In other words, wow. Muslims can't accept a loan with interest, but they can sell a piece of paper with a number on it to an investor, have that piece of paper rented back to them for a Recurring monthly fee that's definitely not called interest and agreed to buy back the paper for number dollars at a future date because that's different I see, I than see. interest. 
You got to admit, though, that that puts the Jew God to shame. You know, I mean, all you need to trick him is tie a string around your neighborhood or whatever, or put the key in your belt buckle. But the full Muslim God, you at least need a CPA. Yeah, 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 exactly. Some derivatives going on. And in the Pope is gay butt sex visiting news tonight. Fresh off of his fuck capitalism <laughs> tour of South America, Pope I Fran so far away as gearing up for a September visit to the U.S. of A., where conservative audiences should just lap up his message of populism and climate stewardship with a spoon. <laughs> Look over great. Wow. While here, the Pope plans to visit Washington, D.C. to address a joint session of Congress, travel to New York to address the U.N. General Assembly, and stop off in Philadelphia to subliminally indoctrinate Americans into submitting to the gay agenda. Um, that last thing, how would uh, subliminal gay propaganda work? Is the Pope going to like turn his normal female marching band uniform into something a little <laughs> more gay or like give his speeches with... Short bursts of gay porn reenactment, and then go back right back to speech. Did he just stick his crozier in that cardinal's ass? Is <laughs> that Tyler Durden's dick? No. <laughs> So, as it turns out, the addresses to the Congress and the U.N. can be found on the Pope's official itinerary for the visit. But to find out about the subliminally gay stuff, you have to turn to online pastor and papal cryptographer William Tapley, who <laughs> announced on his YouTube channel this week that he decoded the secret messages hidden in the logo that Pope Raisin Fran is using to promote his upcoming visit to the city of brotherly throwing shit at Santa Claus. <laughs> good. All right. It's about time somebody <laughs> right. decoded it's that. Good thing someone was working on it. Exactly. <laughs> now, the logo itself, it's like, it's like a minimal representation of a family with indistinct lumps representing the bodies and just circles above them is the head. B basically think a quadruple amputee version of the guy on Wii Sports. But <laughs> where most people would just see a series of droopy semicolons, Tapley sees the hidden butt sex. <laughs> Sometimes a, a colon's just a colon. And there's no dick in it. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. So here's how we get there. Quote, if you look closer at this image, you will see that the two figures are in masculine shape. They are wider at the shoulder, the upper part of the body, and they taper down just like a man. End quote. <laughs> exactly the kind of thing a heterosexual would notice, sir. Is that, is that a wide-shouldered women's room? <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, and then guy who can't even look intimidating when he's squeezing an assault rifle between his man tits news tonight. The spindling wisp of rationality that connected fat guy in a red hat to sanity has predictably evaporated despite visible efforts to keep the smart thoughts in with a really tight hat. In his latest failure to orient his phone like he's shooting a fucking video with it, YouTube preacher and dishonest crowdsourcing parasite Joshua Feuerstein graduated from irksome butt fungus to dangerously untethered psychopath God, in a video yeah. that encouraged his followers to fight back against the gay agenda by murdering people with guns. Yeah, and the entire video was clearly just so he could use this one genius line he came up with about how his... First Amendment rights are protected by his Second Amendment rights. Well, and by came and, up with, you mean heard someone yeah, say. And yeah. no, that's not how it works, no. by the way, at <laughs> exactly. all. Not even close. <laughs> but he had to deliver the big line, and he also had to pick up an object with his hand at the same time. So, right. you know, he got overwhelmed yeah. and flubbed he it. totally did. Flubbed the line. <laughs> One line the whole thing was for, clearly. <laughs> So the video starts off with Feuerstein recalling a series of phantom attacks against Christianity. So he opens with a guy suing Bible publishers to have the word homosexuality removed. <laughs> Seems unaware that that lawsuit he's talking about was summarily dismissed by the courts back in 2008. And then his shit fit continues with a reference to a pastor in Idaho who was threatened with jail time for his refusal to marry gay couples, ignoring the fact that the threat was self-proclaimed and refuted by the people who actually enforce laws and thus threats of jail time. And then he capped it off by bitching about the cake bakers in Oregon who got fined for not baking a wedding cake for a lesbian couple, conveniently omitting the part where the bakers published the fucking phone number and home address of the couple. Convenient, indeed. Yeah. When he delivers these rants, by the way, you know, he's got all these, like, head motions and, and facial expressions. It seems like he thinks his words are all rhyming, like he's in a rap <laughs> battle or something. It seems like he thinks that's what's happening, but... In reality, uh, none of those things are happening. So, you know, I think someone needs to tell him that eh, well, for our sake, all I hope words that don't nobody rhyme, and does. he's not a rapper. Now, let's be clear here. Be like the fact that he's inaccurate in his rant just makes it a fat guy in a red hat video by the, by itself. That's not even you know worth mentioning on the show, except that he then whips out a fucking assault rifle and suggested Christians just murder their way out of this pickle. He goes on to promise that he wouldn't back down any further, which the casual observer would just assume is because he was rendered in ambulatory by the exertion of the aforementioned head dynamics. <laughs> then he also urged his viewers to draw a line in the sand 
presumably because he can't bend over that far without a harness to bring him back up. You know, it's just <laughs> it's one time he goes that far down only once. Yeah, he held the gun up in the frame for about like 15 seconds before he became visibly winded and had to <laughs> put it back down to catch his breath and finish ranting. That definitely yeah. happened. Now, perhaps the most unintentionally hilarious moment in the entire video came towards the end as Fat Guy in a Red Hat expounded on the conspiracy that underlies the whole gay agenda. And as it turns out, it's not about equality. It's about making Christians look like stupid bigots. That's right. The blubbering dumbass whose jowls are touching both frame lines of his vertically shot video as he jostles them about like droopy dog eating pussy and who is exhausted to the point of perspiration by the physical demands of sitting still and talking thinks that we need a worldwide conspiracy to make him look stupid. He's having a lot of trouble. Oh, my God. It's a really funny video, except for like he's telling people to kill other people. And in his it, you know, face doesn't quite fit like in the frame. Pat Hitler or something. The easy way. And from the anal P-Robes file tonight, host of the 700 Club and guy with the facial topography of an upside-down Klingon, Pat Robertson, <laughs> has been oddly quiet recently in the post-gay marriage ruling meltdown department. Okay, wait, wait, wait I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to stop you right there because there's nothing odd about a dead man being quiet. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah, the fact that they keep getting sounds out of the mouth by blowing that billows up his ass is, is the is the crazy part. And never mind, they can't make the words come out sane. It's it's still a pretty impressive trick. Well, I guess somebody reminded Robertson's lawyer about the hateful analogy quota in his contract. So this week, the ass billows guy was ready. <laughs> While taking a call about the recent Planned Parenthood video controversy, P. Robes responded with the standard tirade against the Roe v. Wade decision, and then. Remembering the quota thing, he transitioned smoothly. Speaking of abortions, gay people are getting married. Can you believe this? <laughs> From there, he was able to hit all the old favorites like gay marriage equals pedophilia, gay marriage equals polygamy, and of course, gay marriage equals sex with goats. Check, check, check. Paycheck. Paycheck. You, you know, it's funny. Some of the like running gags on this show give me fits, right? I like, I'm dying for Pope Frant touch this to keel over or retire or something so I can just get a new nickname base to work with. But when it comes to the Pat Robertson's face doesn't fit jokes, like that dude could outlive both of us and we would never run out. It's very likely. Kudos on the upside down Klingon one, though. That that's <laughs> that might be the new bar. Appreciate it. And as we confer on what the name of the trophy for best, the guy who taxidermied Pat Robertson's face ran out of polyfill joke should be, we'll hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey! I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. I've never understood it. They say that God made human beings in his own image. So, is God some kind of self-loathing, verbally abused, overweight, middle-aged, shame-riddled wreck or what? I mean, if we're all made in God's image, what the fuck is wrong with the way we look? I made you in my image. Now cut that thing off your dick. I made you in my image. Now don't you dare make me look at your ugly scalp. And most of all, of course, I made you in my image. Now cover up your naughty bits. The bits that are directly connected to your naughty bits. The parts that kind of remind me of your naughty bits. And the parts that remind me that you have naughty bits. Then cover those coverings with another covering. Because I modeled you after myself and I disgust me. People all over the world are dealing with this to varying degrees, of course, but I think we can all agree that women in Muslim-majority countries are getting way more than their fair share. So the women in moderate Muslim countries look at the fundamentalist countries and see them making it illegal for women to leave the house without looking like Jabba the Hutt in a ninja suit. So they're understandably hypersensitive to anybody overly concerned with their hemline. Which is why activists started sounding the alarm as soon as women in Kuala Lumpur started getting turned away from government buildings because their skirts were too short. This is a signal of a much larger movement toward conservatism that's leaving everyone in the country with a vagina, familiarity with Saudi Arabia, or both terrified. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., we're fighting hard not to head in the same direction. You could reasonably argue that as a whole, our nation is improving in this department. But I'm willing to bet that if you're a woman in rural Texas, you haven't noticed. Throughout the South and the Midwest, local and state governments are hard at work dismantling women's rights, shutting down women's clinics, and enshrining patriarchy into law. Now, usually that's done with an air of head patting, a bit of, don't you worry, young lady, we big strong men know what's best for you, and they have a deep pocket full of patriarchal platitudes to justify it. 
But one of their favorite go-to arguments got a lot harder to justify this week thanks to a study from the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine. The survey followed more than 600 women who had abortions from 30 different facilities for three years. Along the way, researchers assessed how the subjects felt about the choice they'd made to terminate the pregnancy. The final result? More than 90% of the women thought it was the right decision in both the short term and the long term. Anti-abortion activists love to paint the picture of post-abortion women drowning in regret for the rest of their lives. But the numbers don't bear it out at all. And now that there's scientific data that disproves that cliché, I'm sure they'll stop using it altogether. Now, when it comes to regretting not aborting a fetus, well, you'll have to ask Ken Ham's mom about that. That's right, full-time child de-educator and part-time Bill Nye's bitch, Ken Ham has wiggled his way into this segment this week with a blog post explaining why childbirth is painful. And as it turns out, it has nothing to do with the fact that vaginas aren't baby head sized. It's hardly worth mentioning, because a fucking course, it's because of the snake and the apple and the rib lady, not the pelvis that was originally designed for walking on all fours, or the expanded cranium needed to accommodate a human brain. It's the fucking snake. And that's nothing new. But I wanted to bring it up because Ken Ham so perfectly encapsulates all the reasons I hate religion in this one Facebook status-sized blog post. Because what he's actually saying is, if you just stop finding the right answers, our wrong answers wouldn't look as stupid. So I propose a scientific test, Ken. We're going to implant a marble in your dick and let you piss it out. If it doesn't hurt, you're right and women are God-cursed. If it does hurt, you're wrong and objects passing through orifices significantly smaller than those objects is just painful. I'm thinking we'll need a couple dozen trials for a large enough sample size. And with that lovely mental image, I'll hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines from the Cobra Commander file. Prophet Penuel, leader of the End Times Disciples Ministries in Pretoria, South Africa, made news after he talked a number of his parishioners into eating live snake meat as he dangled it into their stupid mouths. <laughs> also worth noting, this is the same guy who reportedly tried to serve motor oil to his congregation, telling him that Jesus will make it taste like pineapple juice. Right, but not the African pastor who convinced his congregation to go outside and eat the grass on the front lawn. That was a different <laughs> South African inedible thing feeding pastor. <laughs> exactly. it, you don't expect that to be a crowded market. You know, who knew? <laughs> so aside from the series of wagers, he's clearly making with somebody about what can I make stupid people put in their face. Prophet Penuel is also known for his unorthodox prayer method in which he instructs church members to take their clothes off so he can sit on their naked bodies and <laughs> therefore... Uh, pray harder, oh, I guess. He's definitely yeah. harder, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be amazed. Ready? Open your mouth. It's going to taste like I'm not raping you. It's going to be amazed. <laughs> You're going to be amazed. Right, who, want, who wants to try next? Raise your hands. Yeah, Line I mean, up right over there. Like, you know, for you and me, this is just really incredibly fucked up. But for these guys, it's just Sunday. You know, they've just been <laughs> going to the, like somebody in that church absolutely positively turned to the guy next to him and said, oh, good. It's just live snakes today. So I was afraid it was going to be something weird. And in Salt and Prepper news tonight, the embezzlement conviction of former Missouri Sheriff Joey Kyle simultaneously got a lot funnier and a lot scarier last week when we learned that the impetus for the embezzlement was the creation of a post-apocalypse survival bunker, complete with about three tons of food reserves, an ample supply of C4, and an arsenal that included an Iraqi-made grenade launcher, all of which he stored in a basement directly below an active courtroom. Uh, I guess we're not up into the part of the Bible yet where they... <laughs> Tell you to stockpile plastic explosives. Is that revelation or? I don't know, but I am dying to reach the part right after that book. So according to Kyle's former colleagues, this genetic hybrid of 1980s Telly Savalas and 1990s Tom Selleck became obsessed with the impending end times after attending a sheriff's conference in January of last year. Go speak to dad. Look at the fucking picture. You'll think the same thing. And while it's not yet clear whether the 6,000 pounds of freeze-dried pineapple spears and tang were purchased with the embezzled funds... We do know that at least some of the Christian County Municipal Law Enforcement budget went to the guy who sells deranged religious zealots grenade launchers and, of course, some of that by extension to Iraqi arms manufacturing. So nice to know he was creating jobs, at least. Yeah, how do you not buy American there? That's right? just unpatriotic. <laughs> and you've got to imagine we make better grenade launchers. Now, we may yet have more juicy details to report on this story. Though Kyle pled guilty to charges of embezzlement in May, he's still the target of at least three ongoing criminal investigations. Because I guess, 
when you're dealing with a mustachioed bullet bill who's willing to use his discretionary police budget to buy projectile explosives with which to kill the horsemen of the apocalypse. All the sentences that start with, I can't imagine he'd go so far as to, those just get tossed out the fucking window. There's no need for any sentence that uses those words in conjunction anymore. (laughs) And finally tonight, from the Atticus Lynch file, notorious reclusive author Harper Lee winner of the 1961 Pulitzer Prize for To Kill a Mockingbird, has released her controversial second novel, a sequel entitled Go Set a Watchman. With over a million copies already sold, this is a huge success for the law firm that controls Lee's estate, which may or may not have published the work against the author's wishes. Reports on that conflict, but the... Uh, Qui who bonoed was definitely the law firm. Yeah, right. And there's no, there's no disagreement about the fact that, like, while she was sane and her brain was working properly, she didn't want For it published. Decades, but never this published is it. So correct. fucking sad. It's like, you know, like Hitchcock may have filmed himself spanking it at some point, but we don't need to see that video <laughs> just because he directed it. If somebody unearths it now, especially if it turned out like that his dick was Hitler. Or had a swastika <laughs> tattoo on it or something. Be a sweet thing, the shot at the beginning where he comes into frame from the side. <laughs> dun, yeah. da, 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 da. <laughs> so, <laughs> one reason that Ms. Lee might not have wanted this published is because the theme of Ghost Set a Watchman, in contrast to To Kill a Mockingbird, it basically says, if we could just get more Americans to be Christian, we could get rid of all this bigotry. <laughs> Probably not. Harper's proudest moment. Well, but in her defense, the real bigots are the Jews and the Chinamen. Am I right? <laughs> uh, this guy knows. This guy. Also worth noting, many readers found they preferred Atticus Finch as a great hero of American literature and not so much as a kindly old racist like he's portrayed in this new release. Yeah. So probably not looking at another Pulitzer. No. But if nothing else, this one will probably go over better with Alabama school libraries than the original. Regardless, we have once again stumbled on a fun new game. We'll need 30 seconds on the clock. Bigoted sequels that nobody should publish ever. Go. All right. All right. How about A Tale of Two Inner Cities? <laughs> it was the worst of times. That's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. just It was Book's just over. terrible. <laughs> what about Pride and Prejudice 2? White People, the sequel. <laughs> It could have been describing the new To Kill a Mockingbird, yeah. Right. How about the dick pics of Dorian Gray? Because that's what the homos do, right? Send pictures of their... <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's correct. They send yeah. each other dick pics of aging British men. Yeah. In, exactly. in time lapse. Exactly. That's what they do. So, uh, all right, what about... great with that Hitchcock video. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, what about... The Redskins Badge of Courage. The autobiography of Dan Snyder. <laughs> You pulled that one out at the last second. I thought that was going to be... guns. Uh, or, or maybe maybe Donald Trump's tale of Depression-era Mexican farmers, The Rapes of Wrath. <laughs> Topical. Well done. Thank you. All right. What about Return of the Rodney King? Tolkien Black Justice. <laughs> Tolkien Black yeah, Justice. Something like that. Um, maybe The Unbearable Lightness of Being Mormon. <laughs> not delightsome enough. <laughs> Pray harder, motherfucker. What about The Last of the Mohicans 2? Here, have a casino. Now we're even. <laughs> the second to The Last of the Mohicans. Uh, maybe Rip Van Winkle 2. What do you mean we still have Jews? <laughs> Speaking of the reason there's a rule against Holocaust sequels, <laughs> about Sophie's Choice 2. Why would you have two more kids? You had to know this was coming. You had to. Why, what do you think we were going to do? And, of course, no list of bigoted sequels that nobody should publish would be complete if we didn't mention the New Testament. And (laughs) speaking of which, we've got a babble to get to. So with apologies for our collective inability to force fit in a Bill Cosby, the big sleep joke, we're going to bring headlines to a close. (laughs) Heath, thanks as always. Jenga! And when we come back, Lucinda will be here to try to scrape a couple more dick jokes out of these damn epistles. The Holy Babel. As we move deeper and deeper into the hard-to-hold-open portions of the end of this book, we find yet more bland and boring letters from Paul, Philippians, and Colossians. In fact, if you told me these were actually the same letters as the last two, but they'd switch the order of the chapters or something, I'd be hard-pressed to dispute it. Yeah, even after Paul's first five letters set up the perfect scenario for... 
more identical letters, these two seem to fall <laughs> flat somehow. It's disappointing. Now, normally I'd spend a few seconds on a quick summary of the books we're about to go over, but since absolutely nothing happens in them, there's nothing to summarize, and I can just skip straight to introducing my lovely wife, Lucinda. Lucinda, welcome back. Did they just not have etc. back then? <laughs> really, you could have just ended yeah. Romans with etc. etc. and we could have skipped yeah. straight to Revelations and been done with it. Would have been nice. Just check those annals of the kings of Judah, you're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but instead, we're stuck with Paul sitting in a prison somewhere and scrawling out a letter to the Philippians, or Philippians. So mm-hmm. at first, it just seems all self-pitying when he whines about being in prison for his love of Christ. But by the end of it, it feels a little less like arrogance and a little more like an overzealous effort to say, don't believe the people who say I was arrested for stumbling around drunk with my dick out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Doing the naked marathon. I got diverted. I don't know what I- <laughs> happened. There's an inordinate amount of passive-aggressive compliments, too. Like when he says, I'll send Timothy around to check on you, since nobody on earth except me and Timothy give a shit about you. Right. And then he tells them, oh, hey, you guys remember Epaphroditus? The guy who uh, the, with the near-fatal communicable disease that I was telling you about? I'm going to send him your way, too. Make sure you give him a hug and a big really sloppy soon. kiss there. <laughs> yeah. Although, I've got to admit, this part came with a rare piece of common-sense advice from the Bible. Paul's basically saying, no, we've been kind of vague... Baiting the pros and cons, but we're making an official call on this. Don't let any dudes mutilate your penis. Don't right. do that. We're doing. <laughs> Trust me, I used to be a Jew, and that kind of thing can get botched. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard it. Finally, like put the hamper down on that one, and then and then he says a lot of confusing nonsense about how great Jesus is, mm-hmm. which you, I was dying could have for. Just summarize this entire testimony. Yeah, right, right. No, yeah, we've had plenty it. of that. But there's also this weird thing where he keeps forgetting that he's supposed to be okay with dying. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not sure if he's going to get killed or whatever for whatever landed him in prison, the naked dick flopping around or the uh, love in Jesus, whichever it was. So he keeps saying shit like, man, I really hope I don't die. And then he's got to backtrack for a few paragraphs. I, I, and, I, and by that, I mean that I really don't give a shit. And it's totally <laughs> fine if I die because Jesus in heaven and yada, 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 which will be way better than this life that I'm desperately clinging to. But woo, boy, it would be nice to also not die so that, you know, I can hang out with you guys again or something. Don't get me wrong. I cannot wait to be tortured and killed. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and again, then right. again. If I skip that stuff, there's no chance I'd be stepping on the Savior's toes. <laughs> Horrible death is kind of his thing. He doesn't want me to... So hard to decide. And and this annoys the fuck out of me. Almost all of the moral advice in the epistles is completely meaningless. It's like mm-hmm. getting directions from my sister-in-law. And they'll just say, like, turn at Main Street with no reference to, like, left, right, <laughs> north, south, or anything like that. <laughs> it's, stuff like, it's like, stand firm in the Lord. Like, what the fuck does that <laughs> even mean? Keep driving for about 45 minutes. Doesn't matter what speed. Whatever speed. 45 minutes no matter what. <laughs> Then take the fork, and um, <laughs> when you cross the railroad tracks, it means you're not there yet. Stop giving me useless information. You've gotten directions from her, too. <laughs> There's also these parts that read like he's writing to a girl that broke up with him back in high school, but he still hasn't quite taken the hint yet. In chapter 4, verse 10, he says, quote, Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. End of quote. Like, isn't that something they should tell you? Right, yes. Isn't that from Paul's end exactly like them not giving a pigeon's turd about him? Yeah, right. Exactly. He's rationalizing not it. Not me, something? it's you. Yeah. And I guess we get to close on that little puzzler because that's all Philippians we get. That's Yeah, over. but have yeah. no fear because we have way more exact same shit coming up <laughs> with Colossians. Again, etc. That's all we need. <laughs> Done, guys. So, unlike Philippians, there, there's a lot of debate about the authorship of Colossians. Most biblical scholars agree that the former was actually written by Paul, but the latter has all the hallmarks of a forgery. And there'd probably be a lot more consensus on that if, if none of the Bible scholars were Christians. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I, I can understand where Christian scholars are coming from. If Paul didn't write all these letters, the otherwise cogent narrative of the Bible really starts to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, so, people might have reasons dangerous. to doubt its veracity at that point, yeah. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so this one starts with the typical several pages of ass-kissing we've come to expect from Pauline epistles. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a little more passive-aggressive than usual. He says a lot of stuff like, ever since we heard about you guys, we've been praying that you would be smarter than you are now. And I'm <laughs> sure you'll get there eventually. It's so close. We're, it's we're, cute. Praying, it's gonna work. Stupid, and there's also a little trying. sprinkling of like, remember before you were Christians when you were evil and worthless? There's a lot of that in there mm-hmm. too. And this is where we learn that God is finally getting a little 
too senile to fulfill his duties, mm-hmm. so they had to put him in a home, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, Jesus now has power of attorney over all that old Jewish stuff. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, doesn't count anymore. Yeah, oh, yeah. Never happened. Smart move, legally, that they made there. Yeah, and this has become a big pet peeve for me. And we get it all through the New Testament. Paul, or whoever's pretending to be Paul for the purposes of this letter, says... Yes, even before you were born, you were sinful and broken, but uh-huh. God has forgiven you. So if I build a porch and the porch collapses, I get to blame the porch, right? Yeah, right, right, exactly. Not my fucking You, fault. random stranger there, I just decided you owe me a million dollars, and I've also elected to forgive your debt. How awesome am I, huh? <laughs> huh? Forgiving what debt? Exactly. Well, <laughs> here's your bill. It's about 10% of your lifetime earnings. Yeah, an occasional bull. Very also, well. and this is important. Don't be fooled by human ways of thinking. <laughs> it actually brains. says that. Yeah, and then we get one of those rare morality bits. Yeah, but it's just more self-evident mm-hmm. shit. Like, I'm reading through it thinking, you know, some poor dude had to carry this letter all the way to Colossae or whatever the hell it's called just to remind them that God doesn't like malice, evil deeds, and greed. Yeah, but if you keep reading, you get to the less moral shit signaled yeah. by the verse that's currently used to justify marital rape. By the way. One of the verses <laughs> right. that's currently used to justify marital rape. Now, in fairness, though, that passage also says the wife is allowed to be, you know, somewhat resentful <laughs> within reason, within reason. <laughs> About the non-consensual sex. And the husband isn't supposed to take it out on her. Right, yeah. Beyond uh-huh. the original raping. So or, or future raping. It's rape. nice. You know, there's a little bit of a feminist message coming through. <laughs> right. Here. Signs through at the end. Right. But that's just there to warm you up for the full-throated slavery endorsement you get at the end of chapter three. Yeah. This is where we get the whole uh, slaves obey your masters even when they aren't looking because God's still watching you and he's judging you by how vigorously your enslaved ass is scrubbing those decks. <laughs> Master paid for those 24 hours, so really be stealing. Technically, according to my 10, you're, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it reminds masters to treat their slaves justly because they too have a master in heaven. And at a glance, that sounds kind of good if you accept that you're, you know, talking to a slaveholder Mm -hmm. to begin with or whatever. But then you start wondering what just means if they're using the guy who drowns whole planets and orders genocide for the you part of the analogy, you know, that's, that makes it a little less impressive. Yeah, significantly so. And then we close with an entire chapter of love to dad type shit. Yeah. It's uh, over. Done. And, and, and here we are, two epistles later, with no new information yep. that we didn't already just read. In fact, there's nothing in this one that we just didn't read in the last one. So, yes, somehow the New Testament has found a way to be more repetitive and less applicable than the Old <laughs> Testament. That is a feat I would have deemed impossible when we finished with Malachi. It's like Paul learned nothing from the Old Testament about pacing. <laughs> you're going to have a series of extremely boring letters. You're going to need to, you know, pepper in some exciting stuff like census data. Or you yeah, know, you're going to lose every attention. <laughs> for example, or at least a talking animal or something. So we're going to mercifully shelve our Bibles for a couple of weeks. This segment will return in three weeks with the last of the Pauline epistles and the anti, 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 anti penultimate installment of the Holy Babel. How about that Woo! shit? Great. Heath Lucinda, thanks again. You're welcome. Love this here. book. And when we come back, Bryce Blankenegel will be here for the happy ending he promised us last week. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, was a brainwashing occultist, a pathological liar, an unrepentant charlatan, an aspiring dictator. A thief, a bum, a racist, a sexist, a plagiarist, a mystic, a mason, a pederast, a polygamist, a con artist, a convict, a fraud, a thug, a smoker, a drinker, a terrorist, a traitor, a theocrat, and a thoroughly despicable bigot. But was he a murderer? Well, we're going to tackle that question and several others tonight in the exciting conclusion of the Carthage Jailhouse Shootout. And joining us once again this week to finish the twisted tale is Bryce Blankenagle of the Naked Mormonism podcast. Bryce, welcome back. Thank you for having me once again, Noah. So, now, when we last left our anti-hero, he was trapped and hopelessly outgunned. Uh, If everyone recalls, of course, somehow, despite being locked in a jail, he's armed with a six-shooter, and he'd been drinking all day. Shot rings out from the angry mob below, and the jail guards abandoned them. And on that dramatic note, I'm going to hand the narrative back to you, sir. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much. So, we have the four gentlemen, Joseph Smith, uh, Hiram Smith, his older brother, William Richards, and John Taylor. 
So when the mob runs up the door after firing their warning shots, all four of these guys ran to the door to try and hold their shoulders against it to, you know, block the intruders or, you know, at least impede their progress a little bit. So one musket ball smashed through the latch on the door, probably because the mob thought that the door was locked. So at this, of course, this freaked all the guys out. And Joe, uh, William Richards, and John Taylor continued holding their shoulder against the door. But Hiram, Joe's older brother, ended up kind of backing away from the door while still facing it because I presume he was freaked out. He was had the adrenaline pump and he was about to get killed. Right. So what ended up happening was one more, the second ball smashed through the center of the door and it struck true. And this hit Hiram just underneath his left eye and embedded in the back of his skull. Another ball smashed through the the window from outside from the mob that had gathered outside of their window and struck Hiram on his left flank, which tore all the way through his body and hit his pocket watch in his breast pocket, shattering it into a thousand pieces. He fell backwards to the floor, exclaiming, quote, I am a dead man, end quote, and laid on the floor profusely bleeding. His bloodstains remain on the floor of the jail to this day. All right, one down, three to go. Right, so nearing death at this point, another ball crashed through the door and grazed Hiram's chest and embedded into his head through the bottom of his throat. Surely dead and motionless by this point, a final subsequent ball lodged into his left leg. Knowing, of course, that Hiram was dead or soon would be, Joe stoically stood up and strode over to the door that was being pushed open by the mob. He pulled out the six-shooter from his pocket and shoved the muzzle of the pistol out the small opening in the door. He snapped off all six chambers, but of course, unluckily, three of them misfired. The three balls that were fired into the mass of bodies in the narrow stairwell struck flesh, killing two men and wounding another man. Okay, now, I, I know that the Mormon apologists hotly dispute the claim that he actually killed anybody, I, even though they freely admit that he fired a gun into a crowd of people hoping to kill some of them. So how do we know what we know uh, on the subject? How do we know what happened to these guys? Well, it's kind of tough to tell because we have to take it from a couple of different sources. But what I would like to do is pull another quote from History of the Church. And when I say History of the Church, this is the church published history that they themselves have recorded and published so this was recorded in history of the church of volume 7 page 102 this was john taylor's recounting of the situation quote he meaning joseph however instantly rose and with a firm quick step and a determined expression of countenance approached the door and pulling the six shooter left by brother wheelock from his pocket opened the door slightly, and snapped the pistol six successive times. Only three of the barrels, however, were discharged. I afterwards understood that two or three were wounded by these discharges, two of whom, I am informed, died. So that was John Taylor, an eyewitness and the third prophet of the church. I'm, I'm sorry, now, he would have been, uh, just to play devil's advocate, he would have been a witness to the events, but not to the death of those three men. So he is just recounting what he heard secondhand in that in that part, right? That is true. However, he also became the third prophet of the church, and it is stated by the church itself that anything that is written by the hand of a prophet is considered to be revelation, divinely <laughs> revealed from God, and therefore scripture and irrefutable. All so, right, well, there you go. Use the your own weapons against them. Yeah, and that's what the what's so easy and great about the history of the church is you can anything that I talk about in my show or that we're talking about here today is all recounted in their own history. Right. They can't really dispute it if they themselves are the ones that recorded it. Yeah, it would be nice if we had, like, Jesus' arrest records. I mean, assuming that Jesus existed. But it would be so nice if we had those kind of historical records like we have for the Mormons. My guess is if there is such a dude, he wouldn't look much better than Joseph Smith. I'm, be I'm willing to agree that you're probably right. I mean, because when you hear the Mormons tell this story, the, you know, Joseph Smith is a martyr that willingly goes to the jail knowing that he's going to be butchered. That that does that kind of conflicts with the idea of a guy standing at the door and firing three shots down trying to kill the, as many people as he can before they come in and shoot him. You know, not exactly yeah. what they said. But but I, I imagine that's probably what really happened with Jesus. You know, whacked the dude's ear off and then they said, oh, you know, we'll tell him later that you put the ear back on or something. <laughs> so Joe has just fired his gun into the stairwell if we believe 
common sense, he fires three times into a crowded stairwell, probably killed somebody. But if we believe the Mormon account, he's got all the aim of an imperial stormtrooper. Hiram's bleeding out on the ground. Now, what, what, there were two other guys, and they were armed, you said, with canes? <laughs> That's right. So actually, Joe firing his rounds into the crowd caused a momentary uh, second for the mob to recoil. Mm -hmm. So uh, before Joe had emptied the gun into the mass, Richards and Taylor had just been using their canes to hit the hands and the guns that were poking through the slightly open door. They were just trying to move the guns and deflect the shots. But, right. You know, this was inevitably a useless effort. And I love the fact that one of these dudes is hugely fat. I'm sorry, because like, I know Mormons just look like, you know, people of the 1840s, back in the 1840s, but I'm imagining two Mormon missionaries in white button down with the short sleeves <laughs> and the black, and, and like hitting, you know, guns with the canes and one of them weighing, it's, it's looking like a deleted scene from, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon musical. <laughs> I like it. We should uh, we should petition Matt and Trey see if they yeah, uh, add so that they scene do a little there. sequel there, yeah, or a prequel, I guess. Yeah, this for be. sure. So the next victim of this mob was actually John Taylor, who we talked about was the third prophet of the church. Mm -hmm. So he had been wildly swinging his cane at the barrels and the bayonets that were you know discharging in the room. And once he realized that resistance was futile, he took advantage of this momentary slowing of gunshots that were entering the, entering the room. And of course, he left his post at the door and sprang for the open window. Just as he left his post, there was a ball that was fired from the stairway that crushed through his left thigh that shattered his femur bone. This caused him, in his own words, to lose all control of motor functions to that leg, and he collapsed on the floor right in front of the window, unable to jump out, yet visible to the mob that was outside. Then there was a ball that was fired from the mob outside that hit Taylor in the chest, that actually ended up striking his pocket watch in his breast pocket and froze the hands at 5, 16, 20, and 26 seconds p.m. This is just some slow motion and a few doves away from a John Woo flick. I love it. Okay. <laughs> right? So this would have been a kill shot. Mm -hmm. But the watch luckily diffused the majority of the ball's energy, and this momentarily saved Taylor's life. And, of course, the energy from the ball threw him back into the room away from the window. So he collapsed. He was collapsed on the floor, and two more balls, presumably fired from the stairwell, entered his leg below the left knee, and then one entered his arm, shattering his left wrist and embedding into the fleshy part of his left hand. So he rolled underneath the bed with four musket balls inside of him. While he remained under the bed, he was shot once more, and this ball... It's, it's kind of graphic how he recounts it, but it passed through his left hip and ripped a large chunk of flesh, quote, the size of my hand, end quote, off of his hip bone. So with Hiram unconscious and bleeding out on the floor and Taylor getting shot into human Swiss cheese, Joe decided to make a run for the window just like Taylor had tried seconds earlier. Joe, almost in slow motion, I'm sure at this point, dropped the pistol and turned around and ran to the window. So at this point, nobody was trying to hold the door closed. There was Willard Richards, but we'll get to him in a minute. The mob entered the room and they took aim at the fleeing Joe. Joe got to the window and stood with both hands raised to the square on both sides of his head and yelled, quote, Oh Lord, my God. Right at that point, Two balls from the mob in the room entered his back, and two from outside entered his chest. Joe collapsed and fell from the second-story window onto the ground in front of the mob. He was dead and laid motionless on the ground outside Carthage Jail, slain by a painted, black-faced, faceless mob. So let's cut back to the jail cell. Once Joe fell out of the window, the mob inside realized it and... They ran down the stairs to make sure that their job was done, of course, leaving Willard Richards and human sieve John Taylor in the room alone. The 350-pound mass of human shield Willard Richards was the only man in the room that day to leave without a single bullet hitting him. No shit. Right. Amazing, right? Somehow, the other three men in the room were shot to a point that they were scarcely recognizable as the men that they once were. But the ultimate fat ass in the room 
didn't even get a hole in his jacket from a stray. Well, now that's the only positive thing that we can say about Joseph Smith so far is that at least he wasn't immoral to just uh, immoral enough to just climb behind the fat guy. The only <laughs> I'm trying to find something nice to say about the guy in this story. I mean, he does die by the end of it. Yes, huh? uh, yeah, fair enough. So the fat guy is, uh, is is trying to make a break for it. I can only imagine how he's huffing and puffing. Well, yeah, he was afraid that the mob was going to come back and finish the job. Mm -hmm. So he tried to leave, and Taylor, that was who was still bleeding under the bed heard him attempt to leave the room and said, wait, take me with you, of course. So he ended up covering him with an old mattress to try and hide him from the mob. Richards was convinced that he was going to die at this point, and he was hoping that at least Taylor would be alive to tell his tale. But the cry was soon issued that the Mormons are coming, meaning the Nauvoo Legion and the mob just disbanded. Everybody fucked off. A little bit late. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. So Richards and Taylor both lived to tell their tale, and John Taylor ended up becoming, like I said earlier, the third prophet of the church after Bloody Brigham in Salt Lake City. I, I guess the real obvious question to me here is, we're talking about a guy who had, like you said, a standing army that, that damn near rivaled the American regulars at this point. Why weren't they there? That's actually a really good question. We don't know, primarily because Joe had so many fucking enemies. So many people wanted him dead at the time. Now, there's speculations that um, Brigham Young could have been somehow involved. The only thing that we can say to that is the whereabouts of Brigham Young weren't accounted for at the time, nor were, were the whereabouts of Hosea Stout, his right-hand man. So... We can kind of speculate and say that maybe there was some connection there. And then we also have the fact that Willard Richards, the only guy that wasn't shot, that returned or that ended the entire day completely unscathed, was the cousin of Brigham Young and it ended up holding a leadership position in the church. So there's possible ways to say that Brigham Young might have had some sort of connection with it, but we can't say anything definitively, of course, because Brigham Young was really good at covering his own tracks. Now, I know that the Mormons try to make this sound more like the end of Braveheart than the end of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but I, I'm, I'm curious how the real history that you've uncovered up to this point compares to what you were taught as a Mormon growing up in the church. Do they tell you at all about the, the Carthage uh, shootout? Honestly, it doesn't compare at all. I mean, I wasn't told who was trying to kill him. It was just, well, Joseph was arrested because of persecution against the church because mm -hmm. people didn't think that he was a real prophet. Then a mob gathered. Then they ran up to his jail cell and then they shot him and he fell out of a window. And that was it. That's all I knew. And you can confront them with it and they'll own up to it honestly and mm -hmm. say, yes, well, okay, he did have a pistol that was smuggled in, but they they never um, they never reveal it right offhand and come by it honestly. You have to ask. You have to dig. You have to know the reality of the situation before you can investigate what they're actually reporting and the, the veracity of their claims. Yeah, right, because who would think to themselves, well, I, gee shucks, I wonder if he had a gun in that prison. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and they actually have the gun in their own museum of the Carthage jail. Really? They, they, they have the gun itself. They have the watch from John Taylor that's uh -huh. frozen at 5.16 p.m. They have all of the artifacts from that day, but they just don't say anything about it. There's just like, here's a pistol. Here's some clothes with some blood stains on them that might have been Joseph's. <laughs> like, that's wow. it. Yeah, no, I guess it, it certainly fucks up the whole martyr, martyr tale. And it's also worth noting that this is only one of the many fucked up stories in Mormon history, and I would say by <laughs> no means the most fucked up one. No. So if you'd like to learn more about the various ways that Scientologists ain't got shit on the Mormons, be sure to check out Bryce's show, Naked Mormonism. You'll find that on iTunes, Stitcher, and of course linked in the show notes for this episode. Bryce, thanks again for joining us, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's almost time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. But before we get there, I need to give Heath a chance to respond to a challenge from last week. Because during part one of my interview with Bryce, I made a passing comment about Heath coming up with names for a Mormon brothel. And now it occurs to me that I never actually gave you a chance to do so. So, All right. I, I appreciate the chance. All right. How about um, Mitt Romney's Binder Grinder? Oh, nice. Or... <laughs> Big Amy's Big Love Shack. All right, all right. Or how about STD Calf, the LD Escort Service? Oh, nice, nice. Well done, sir. <laughs> That's all I got. It's sad to consider how close the world came to being deprived of your pun mastery. And with that out of the way, I guess we could do the uh, listener feedback bit. And away we go. 
Our first message comes from Jimena, filling us in on some of the backstory about why the Pope is chewing on coca leaves and why that matters. Mm -hmm. Apparently, she's been an activist in this area for a number of years and wanted to subtly remind us that chewing coca leaves shouldn't be conflated with snorting cocaine, which sounds like a very reasonable reminder. Well, right. And she granted that we were just like doing it as a joke. But after reading up on some of the racism and shit that surrounds that misunderstanding, it makes a lot of sense to offer a correction. So... No, the Pope was not doing lines off the thighs of a Bolivian hooker. It was more like doing mild Adderall off the thighs of a Bolivian hooker. (laughs) Anyway, we also got an email from Asshole, who assholes, quote, I tried to listen to your podcast to see what the other side believes in an effort to be of open-minded. Sick. After five minutes, I guess it's clear that all you have to offer is insults and F-bombs. Religious people aren't stupid, But on the unlikely chance, sick, that anyone ever listens to your podcast, they certainly would be. End quote. I think he's a little bit confused. I mean, yeah, way to counterbalance that your stupid narrative I had going there, buddy. (laughs) Exactly. And finally, we got an urgent call to duty from Miriam. Yes, we did. Quote, I read an article today that may reveal the thing that you two have been training for your whole lives. <laughs> it looks like Pornhub is trying to crowdsource a space launch to do zero gravity space porn. Yep. And as far as I'm aware, they haven't settled on any titles yet. Nope. Your time has come. You guys and gal were born for this. End quote. <laughs> so we'll offer this week's top 10 titles for Pornhub space porn. Okay, so number 10, the filth element. Just so that Chris Tucker's character can finally fuck somebody with that hair. You know, if you're going to show up and ruin a whole goddamn movie, at least fuck somebody with your hair, man. Totally redeem it, yeah. At number nine, robotic Armageddon on with Sally Ride. (laughs) Elbow deep impact. Oh, wow, like that didn't have enough jokes, so you had to throw one more in. Excellent, well done. Number eight, the day the girth stood still. So long that we had to call a physician. (laughs) E.T.'s got E.D. Exactly. <laughs> At number seven, Sky Rockets in Flight, Shafterpoon Delight. <laughs> or number six, Guardians Gone Wild, because there are no laws about what you can and can't do with a raccoon in space. Think about it, Pornhub. <laughs> Think about it. At number five, Battle Starfish Galactica. Get some frack in the crack. <laughs> or number four, how about Glandra Bullocks in Cavity? I, now, I don't want to tell you where the Hubble winds up in this one, because I, I, I don't want to spoil the moment, but you'll love it when it happens. At number three, Wall Ejaculate, the white stuff that caused the Andromeda stain. Oh, nice. And of course, at number two, we have Christopher Nolan's In Her Cellar. It's basically the same story, but with a brown hole instead of a black one. And at number one, Mountain Control to Major Dong, a face oddity. Nice. Either take those protein spills or put your helmet on. It's one or the other. <laughs> Make up your mind. I, there's got to be a 2,000 girls, one cup joke in there somewhere, but I just can't reach deep <laughs> in enough to fish it out. Damn it. And that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending us those emails, tweets, and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Before we smash the plates tonight, I want to thank the New Testament for being way shorter than the old one. Because there's just no fucking way I could make it through 1,300 pages of this shit. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you this week, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, on Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Do believe we will be making a big, exciting announcement at the end of that episode, so you probably want to check that out. Otherwise, you won't know what the big exciting announcement was. Of course, I just can't call it an episode if I don't thank Heath one more time for always giving us two testicle jokes for the price of one. I need to thank the lovely Lucinda Lusions for lending us her dulcet tones, her coquettish laugh, and her vitriolic dick analogies once again this week. Another big thanks to Bryce Blankenagle of the Naked Mormonism podcast for joining us once again this week. If you haven't checked his show out yet, there's still time to correct that oversight. You'll find a link on the show notes for this episode. Also need to thank Michael of the LC Valley Atheist Alliance on Facebook for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you're looking for another way to dilute the religious big 
bigotry and pro-Confederate flag shit your racist uncle posts. You'll find a link to his Facebook page on the show notes as well. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's most amiable atheists, Kevin, Wendy, Jason, George, Nicole, Aditya, Rachel, Jeff, Lisa, Other Lisa, James, Alex, Bart, Joel, and Andrew. Kevin, Wendy, Jason, George, and Nicole, who have enough sexual magnetism to levitate a frog. Aditya, Rachel, Jeff, Lisa, and Other Lisa, whose IQs are higher than the spider that lives in my bong. And James, Alex, Bart, Joel, and Andrew, whose ejaculations have their own tsunami warning designation. Together, these minions of the Dark Lord Satan that pretend not to believe in God so that Alex Jones won't figure out who's eating all these babies have helped us disinform the public as to our true nefarious intentions this week by giving us money. If you think you've got what it takes, you too can aid the charade by making a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist or by making a one-time donation by clicking on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help but you won't have any spending money until that Nigerian prince gets back with you, you can also help us a ton by giving us a five-star review on iTunes, adding us to your favorites on Stitcher, liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter... You know, shit, at that point, it's probably easier just to give us some money. Anyway, one way or the other, we appreciate you giving us an hour of your life this week, and we're going to be working very hard to earn another hour next week. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at skatingatheist.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by yours truly, and yes, I did have my permission. All right. That's why I own my computer. It's for the pointy dicky stuff.